Hello and welcome to this webinar organized by the Lancet Citizens Commission on Reimagining India's Health System. First, a few words of introduction uh, about the commission. My name is Vikram Patel. I am a professor of global health at Harvard Medical School and one of the co-chairs of the Lancet Citizens Commission. The commission is an ambitious cross-sectoral endeavor that aims to lay out a citizen's roadmap to achieving universal health coverage in India. It aims to be a comprehensive effort that combines the voices from across the spectrum of citizens and actors in the health system through a range of different research, uh, ongoing research uh, exercises, with the goal that ultimately all of this knowledge and all of this experience can inform how we might realize universal health coverage in the very diverse communities uh, that comprise our country. The commission has a very strong uh, uh, agenda for public engagement, for reaching out to diverse sections in India and abroad who are concerned with UHC in India. And one method of doing so is the website and our monthly webinar series. The monthly webinar series now running for about 18 months serves as a platform for public health discourse and a means for academics, practitioners and civil society to engage on substantive and timely issues regarding universal health coverage in India. We hope very much that you will enjoy this webinar, uh, but please let us know how you think it went. There will be a survey at the end of the webinar, and I hope as many of you as possible will fill it out. Let us know your thoughts and suggestions, both about this webinar, but very importantly, about topics for future webinars that you'd like us to arrange. And finally, you can always sign up to receive the commission newsletter, which will give you alerts for future webinars, new resources that the commission uh, has produced, but also resources by others on universal health coverage in India, as well as related events. Let me turn now to today's webinar. Today's webinar is being co-hosted with the Population Foundation of India, Sangat, and the Association for Socially Applicable Research. And of course, today, the webinar is commemorating World Mental Health Day. World Mental Health Day is marked every year on October the 10th, and this year it is also part of the Mental Health Week. The theme this year for World Mental Health Day is making mental health and well being a global priority for all. I think we can all agree that this has never been more important thanks to the pandemic. But while much has been written about the mental health crisis in the shadow of the pandemic, let's be clear of one fact. The world was experiencing a mental health crisis well before the pandemic. This crisis is reflected in many ways. For example, the rising burden of mental health problems. That, of course, includes substance use problems and self-harm and the very large unmet needs for care for people with mental health problems. What the pandemic has done is add fuel to the fire. And in most countries, particularly affecting young people, we have seen these metrics get worse. Moving forward, we must deepen the value and commitment we give to mental health as individuals, as communities, in the health system, and at the level of policymakers. And we must match that value with more commitment, engagement, and investment by all stakeholders across sectors, because mental health is fundamentally an intersectoral issue. And if there's one reason I believe that we have failed to shift the needle on mental health in our population, mental ill health in our population, it is because we have viewed mental health from a very narrow biomedical paradigm. Today's panel will discuss how we can achieve these goals of valuing, promoting, and protecting mental health, where everyone has an equal opportunity to enjoy good mental health and where everyone can access the mental health care they need. I'm delighted that our panel today brings together four voices that represent very diverse stakeholder groups concerned with mental health, the lived experience, researchers, public engagement, policy making, and philanthropy. Shubrata Prakash is an officer with the Indian Revenue Service. 
drawing from real life experience and meticulous research, Shubrata shares her expert knowledge on what it means to live with depression, how to identify your particular strain and overcome your sense of hopelessness through a book, The D Word, A Survivor's Guide to Depression. Welcome, Shubrata. Raj Mariwala is the director of the Mariwala Health Initiative. This is an organization that is working towards a community-based nationwide mental health ecosystem that is continually evolving and accessible to the most marginalized. Raj also serves on the boards of the Global Mental Health Action Network, the Lancet Commission on Stigma and Discrimination that was launched today or will be launched today at, an, uh, uh, at a webinar co-hosted with the Lancet, and Parcham, a nonprofit that serves adolescent girls through sports. Patty Gonzalez is a mental health researcher with a background in psychology and global health. She brings specific expertise in engaging young people with a lived experience through program development, research, and advocacy. She serves as a director in Sangat, a Indian mental health research NGO, where she directs a portfolio of participatory youth research projects and digital innovations, supported by a range of funders. Patty founded the It's Okay to Talk National Public Engagement Campaign, which was recently recognized by Facebook as one of the leading international youth mental health projects. And finally, Andrea Bruni is a experienced mental health professional with more than 15 years of international experience across the world, but including in the South Asian region. In fact, Andrea has only recently taken on his leadership role as a regional advisor for mental health for WHO's Southeast Asian Regional Organization. So I'd like to welcome all four of my distinguished panel, panel, panelists today and, and thank each and every one of you for taking the time out to share your thoughts about a World Mental Health Day today. Uh, we will go through the four panelist presentations in sequence, uh, and then we will have a Q&A. I'd invite those of you who would like to ask questions to use the Q&A panel uh, uh, that you see in your Zoom window. And I'll try and make sure that we get to as many questions as possible. So without much further delay, I'm going to invite Shubrata Prakash to give her presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. And greetings of the day to everyone who's tuned in, whichever part of the world you're uh, listening and watching this from. So uh, today's topic has already been introduced by Dr. Patel, you know, making mental health and well-being a global priority for all. Now, from where I see it, um, pardon the pun, but this should be a no-brainer. We shouldn't even have to say this. But we are having to say this because, unfortunately, mental health and mental well-being somehow does not get the importance that it should be getting. In fact, mental health is often you know, seen different from physical health, whereas we all know that there is no health without mental health. And the, the, the very, you know, the divide between mental health and physical health is kind of artificial because well-being is well-being. We all need to feel good and, you know, we all need to have a sense of wellness. So from my perspective, you know, someone of uh, someone who has lived experience of depression, um, also anxiety disorder, I, I live with it every day and recently diagnosed ADHD, uh, which is another thing, which, uh, which is something that also we should be looking at, you know, not just uh, mental illness, but also neurodiversity is something that I have been trying to push across to everyone that I get an opportunity to talk to. So uh, my experience has been that, you know, mental health, uh, is, at least in the society in which I live, is often noticed only by its absence. It's, it's conspicuous by absence. You know, when people begin to uh, fall on the illness part of the health spectrum, mental health spectrum, that we actually set up and notice that, okay, something is wrong with me. And um, as an individual, we, it's, it's then that we wake up and probably uh, go out and seek help. And even from the point of view of society, uh, you know, there are so many things like uh, people who have severe mental illness, society just writes them off. I mean, why bother? They are mad. These are the words that I use for uh, people with severe mental illnesses. And people who have common mental illnesses like disorders like depression in my case, or anxiety disorder, uh, these are often seen as moral failings, 
weakness of character, a choice that people who are not able to uh, cope up with the challenges of life, they end up having. So again, in their case, people, uh, society generally has the view that, okay, if it's a choice, if this is how they want to be, so why don't we just let them be? Who bothers? Who cares? And it is here that people like me suffered the most because I went through five years of depression without being diagnosed. I started showing, showing signs of postpartum depression after the birth of my first child. And it took me five years to get diagnosed. And I, I'm, I'm one of the first people to admit that a lot of the fault lies with me because I was not aware. I was completely ignorant of anything mental health. I also lived in the same society which sees that as a moral failing. I used to believe the same until I was told that I have depression. And uh, if I may say so myself, I was one of the strongest people that I knew. So much so that um, I had a few other health conditions. I, I was born with a congenital health uh, heart, heart uh, problem. And um, when I was diagnosed at, in, my, in my 20s and then I went uh, through surgery for it and there was a lot of things happening around that. I didn't get depression at that time. And I, uh, there was a lot of strength, uh, mental strength, which was required at that time to deal with that issue. I went through all of it. I, I never even thought that I could be a weak person. And this was a turning point in my life. I started looking at mental health from a completely different lens. And uh, as I was trying to find ways to help myself get better, there was so much of stigma, so many stigmatizing comments that were coming from all various uh, people. Uh, and uh, th those comments were really, really hampering my recovery because I knew that there was something wrong probably in my brain. There was something wrong with my body that however much I tried, I took antidepressant medication. I was taking psychotherapy. I was trying to do everything possible. You know, I was trying to meditate. I was trying to write. I was trying to go out and work out on the few days that I could. But despite all these efforts, I was just not able to get better. So there was definitely something which was not in my control. Uh, and uh, it was really, really disheartening to, 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 to say the least when people would tell me that, why are you depressed? Why don't you just get up and walk? Get, just just, just stay, say, you know, get out depression. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to tell them that, look, I have been saying get out depression, but depression is not getting out. It, it doesn't work that way, obviously. And, but somehow in, the, in this whole process, I had started internalizing all that stigma. I had started believing that maybe I'm making a choice to stay in bed. I've may started making a choice not to take care of my kids. And all of this um, is what prompted me to start talking about this, learning even more. So uh, one more thing that goes with, um, the, the, you know, why we, we're talking about this today and why we need to focus on mental well-being is that as a woman who had just delivered a child, uh, when I was crying in the hospital, there should have been systems which should have been, you know, I should have been screened at that point of time. I wasn't. Uh, the, apart from psychiatrists, I've also seen that other medical professionals are not all that aware of uh, you know, mental health challenges and issues and signs and symptoms. So we, we, we should have systems where, you know, other me medical professionals are also trained to look out for these signs. And even after that, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's another thing that uh, you get screened, but then what, what happens after that? How many people are able to actually access care, affordable care? So, that's, that's another thing that though I am a civil servant, I'm married to a civil servant, uh, and we, would, uh, we, we had a lot of privilege in life, but still it was so difficult accessing care. It was so expensive. And sometimes I have received stigmatizing comments, even from therapists and psychiatrists, what to say of other people. So this actually really shouldn't have to be. And um, I, the way, the way forward, um, when it comes to this, the way I see it, of course, this is not based on any research, but this is what someone who lives with a condition like anxiety disorder would like to see is that uh, there should be safe spaces. And maybe these spaces, uh, 
I'm trying to create some of them, but it shouldn't just be people with lived experience. It shouldn't just be psychiatrists and psychologists and psychotherapists. The whole society needs to come together and create these safe spaces where I can speak, where people can speak. And when I say depression, I had depression. People shouldn't look at me as if I'm eating or I have landed up you know, from another planet. Uh, people shouldn't you know, flinch. I've seen people flinching whenever I mention that I have a mental health condition. I have seen people actually flinch. That shouldn't have to be. <laughs> then uh, when I get panic attack, I often get panic attacks in office, in, in my workplace. And I've spoken about this at my workplace as well. So uh, there should be safe spaces where people understand that, okay, she's going to something. Just give her a little bit of uh, space. Don't crowd in. Don't ask her questions. See if she needs help. So those, those are the systems. Those are the things we really need to have in place. This is what, as a survivor, I would like to see. And um, I cannot repeat this enough. Anyone who's listening in, apart from the overall larger picture, which my other uh, co-panelists will be talking about, um, I, uh, I just would also want to uh, give out a few messages, Dr. Patel, through this panel, through this panel and this plat platform. Uh, the first of which is that it's okay to not be okay. Of course, it's not comfortable. I used to feel awful, awful when I had severe depression. But at the same time, we do need to acknowledge that mental health is something that cannot be perfect all the time. And whether you're having a bad day or whether you actually have a diagnosed uh, medical, con medical, let me not use the word medical, but let's just say a clinical condition. In either case, it's just okay to not be okay. You have to get better, but there should be no shame or stigma in it. Do not internalize the stigma that society throws at you. And uh, these conditions are treatable. These conditions can be lived with. Uh, whatever works, because not everything works for everyone. Uh, antidepressant medication did not work for me. I only got better when... I went off my medication. Not true for everyone. There are a lot of people who really benefit from the medication. But um, do, keep, do not lose hope. Do keep trying. And maybe there will be a day when all our efforts will really pay off, when there will not be so much of stigma around mental health, uh, where it will not, uh, where one will not need to be brave to talk about having a lived experience of a mental health condition and where there is space even for neurodiversity, where people understand what it is to have, let's say autism or ADHD, and how much of effort it takes to mask the symptoms and work on those. So these are a few things that I had in mind. And um, I also want to thank my fellow panelists here and Dr. Patel for this opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, let's keep going, let's keep working. There will be one day, I'm hoping, because hope is the only thing that I have as someone with lived experience that mental well-being and mental health will receive the actual importance that it deserves uh, all over. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shubrata, for get, getting this uh, this uh, panel going with such passion. Uh, you know, the lived experience always uh, must be at the center of everything that we do in, in, in the area of health. And I think um, your, your hopeful message is one that I share. I actually do think that uh, there has been a dramatic shift in attitudes. There's still some way to go, of course, uh, but I think it's incredible how easy it is for people to talk about mental health in a sensitive way today relative to what it used to be like even just 10 years ago. Uh, and I think there has been a, a, a monumental change, a shift in the attitudes that people have in the community, in the media, and in government. And I'm sure we'll circle back to what more needs to be done uh, to keep on on this road. But let me now switch on to this uh, to our second uh, 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 panelist, uh, uh, Raj Mariwala. The floor is yours. Thanks, thanks. I'm uh, so grateful to be sharing uh, space with you all and to be part of this important conversation on mental health and well-being for all. Um, the critical emphasis being on the for all part. Uh, and so I'll share my thoughts or approach on the basis of the work that uh, my organization does. Um, and, you know, what sort of an approach uh, would one take if one was planning from a philanthropy perspective or just even a larger sector perspective 
about how to look at the for all. Um, and uh, for me, the answer lies in the fact that uh, there are structural and systemic barriers that decisively affect an individual's well being. And then further, those same factors affect um, how that person accesses healthcare and support both. Now, the moment we look at it like this, it allows us to situate um, you know, mental health within people's lives, experiences, contexts. Uh, but more importantly, it allows us to understand that historically marginalized people may be disproportionately impacted by mental health concerns. Now, it could be that there is a greater vulnerability to stressful events, a lack of social support. Um, and of course, adding to that, the fact that there is oppression, which affects the access, provision, even the suitability of mental health care and services. And unfortunately, these same systems that historically marginalize people uh, also govern public policy and socio-cultural norms. So you're seeing it in the health sphere, in the social sphere, and in the economic sphere. Now, all of these factors combine to, you know, to make us have a theme such as this, because these perpetuate inequalities in mental health. Now, I'll just break this down. What do I mean by this? Um, so in tangible terms, and in the South Asian context, we know that class, caste, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, and disability play a very important role in determining the daily stresses, exposure to stress, the vulnerability to mental ill health, and also they determine then how you can address this mental health concern, right? Both in terms of the services that are out there and maybe wider social supports, as well as in the quality of care and support received. And of course, we all know, as I said previously, that all public and social institutions also um, you know, combine to kind of interlock and make the situation worse, make the inequalities worse. So uh, I'll just, I like examples. So now a 2021 study by Azim Premji University said that 230 million Indians were pushed into poverty post uh, the first year of COVID. Now this meant widespread unemployment, loss of income, food insecurity and homelessness. Now uh, you're already vulnerable due to food insecurity. It's a risk factor for physical health for sure, but also for mental health. Um, and because you're undernourished, there is distress, there is anxiety, shame. Um, you're at risk for depression and anxiety as well. And of course this is combined right with an increase in healthcare costs because all of a sudden you're undernourished. Um, and then this shares a relationship with poverty. So now we know that there's a relationship with poverty, then homelessness and mental illness. Now, this homelessness itself places an individual at a higher risk of developing mental illness. And of course, the other is also true. Uh, there is an increased risk of becoming homeless due to mental illness, right? And of course, the psychological dimensions itself of homelessness, um, you know, we don't need to stick to the, the biomedical as Dr. Patel said, there are very high levels of stress, uncertainty, anxiety combined with, because remember I said, we are more vulnerable then uh, to greater exposure to violence, unemployment, lack of access to education. Now, if I take this a step further, because I spoke about historical marginalization, now the women out of these 230, 230 million who were pushed into poverty, uh, they faced increased homelessness, but with that increased homelessness also came an uh, vulnerability to sexual assault and gender-based violence. Now what happens when uh, gender-based violence enters the picture? Again, you may experience depression, anxiety, stigma, shame. And now if we break this down a little more, uh, into further historical marginalizations. Um, who's not included in the definition of women typically? Who are services not designed for? They're not designed for trans women. They're not designed for Dalit women. They're not designed for Adivasi women. They're not designed for women with disabilities. 
So now, if we take this example further down, one more step, um, you know, one, five out of six multidimensionally poor people in India are from Dalit, Adivasi, or OBC families. And then further, over one third of these persons are homeless and Dalit. So unless we use such a lens, we are not going to be able to break the intergenerational cycle of social discrimination, exploitation, and exclusion, right? If we want to reach mental health for all, we will have to address this exclusion. Uh, this exclusion. Similarly, so for trans women, I won't go into the details there, um, but in terms of the kind of policy interlocking, um, if we are to look at this scenario of homelessness, maybe lack of employment, food insecurity, we need identification cards um, because social safety nets need identification cards. Um, and we know that trans women or trans folks don't have easy access to identity cards. And this also happens to be true actually for Dalit persons who are homeless. A study found that despite having identification, almost no Dalit people were able to access benefits, right? So if we are to address these and all the mental health issues that come with the, these types of exclusions, um, we must take a lens of looking at how to build our systems for people who have been historically marginalized. And of course we know that I'm not even talking about the discrimination that one faces, right? Um, but it's very important to say here that this discrimination and this exclusion is embedded in our healthcare systems themselves. Uh, whether it is LGBTQIA persons who face forced treatment and conversion and cure, or whether it is very well documented, um, you know, instances of Dalit folks not um, being able to enter health centers or not being touched by doctors. Now we all know that changes in the policy environment can be very important in addressing these inequalities, in addressing mental health for all. Um, but of course, social change is also required. But I think to all the funders in the room, I'm going to say that policy changes are important to support and they will likely proceed cultural change, um, right? So if we are to look at steps to dismantle the ways in which casteism, patriarchy, religious discrimination, ableism have been institutionalized in a variety of ways, um, you know, we can't resolve unequal access to care if we don't address all of the ways in which these exclusions happen. And I think one very important part of this work, and I think what the commission also stresses on, is learning from uh, people's lived realities and centering the knowledge and the labor of the margins. Now, this type of work cannot be done without the involvement um, and the participation and the leadership, I would say, of people who are marginalized by these structures. Um, so I, I mean, I think to all the funders in the room, as well as everyone else, I'm going to end by saying, uh, if we are to understand inequalities in mental health, let's really look very closely at what causes them, what perpetuates them. And then how would you inform the calls for more services, better quality services, data and research and increased funding, um, right? So I'm, and uh, you know, I, I think I'll still end by saying that we can't consider mental health um, in isolation from other areas of development, such as education, employment, emergency responses, and human rights. So it's not enough um, to provide mental health services alone, uh, as Dr. Patel said, that it can't be just biomedical. We have to have linkages to services that support livelihoods, shelter, and social inclusion. Um, and so, in my opinion, if we are to look at mental health for all, um, we must build for the margins because then we will reach everyone. But if we start off by building just for the center, uh, we will never reach the margins. Thanks. Thank you, Raja. Thank you for those very powerful words that, that you ended your remarks with. And I think for constantly reminding us uh, 
about the central role of equity when we think about uh, mental health. In, in fact, I think this applies across the health uh, 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 areas, um, but I think particularly mental health, one could argue, for all the reasons you mentioned um, about historical disadvantage that is perpetuated in everyday living experiences of people, um, and which of course also extend all the way into the healthcare system. And you're right to point out that it isn't correct that mental health problems are equally distributed in the population. In fact, groups in the population that have been historically disadvantaged for one reason or the other, the biggest group, of course, of all um, is, is women um, uh, who, thanks to the patriarchal system uh, that continues to be very prevalent in India, uh, are, is, is one of the most important factors that explains the excess of mood and anxiety problems in women. And, uh, and to deal with this issue purely through a biomedical lens is to miss actually a unique opportunity for prevention and promotion, which is of course a key element of, today, uh, of, of the World Mental Health Day theme today. It's not about just treatment, but about well-being. And well-being isn't going to be attained just through hospitals and, 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 and doctors. So I'm sure we'll circle back uh, to some of these very important subjects, particularly the, the big vexing question, what can we do about shifting some of these, sometimes what may feel like really enormous challenges like uh, you know patriarchy, for example, or poverty, they may seem so abstract and political and beyond the reach of ordinary uh, uh, you know, people in, in civil society. I'm sure that's a question that you're gonna get asked. What can we do as citizens uh, to actually uh, uh, address these huge uh, challenges? Let me move on. To our third panelist, uh, Patty Gonzalez works with Sangat. Patty, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm also, yeah, I think, echo the other panelists' <clears throat> gratitude in being part of this conversation. Uh, I'll be focusing my uh, next few minutes on one of the groups that we uh, have touched on, so young people, adolescents and young people, who are, form a very important demographic uh, group. And I'll just begin by giving you a bit of uh, background on why I'll be talking about this group, and then a few insights from our work on ways that we actually can try to reach uh, everyone uh, as part of the, the topic for today, which is you know sort of making mental health accessible to everyone. Um, just for a bit of context, um, so as I said, the, the sheer scale of uh, young people, so there are around 1.2 billion uh, people or sort of one in six uh, people is a young person aged uh, 10 to 19. So this graph here is helping you uh, to see where young people are uh, all over the world. And the vast majority, uh, about 90% of young people actually live in low and middle income countries like India, where uh, this discussion is being uh, focused. And um, the second important thing to highlight is, is the very large contribution of uh, youth mental health problems to the overall global burden of disease. So mental health problems are collectively the major cause of disability in this age group. Uh, and it accounts for about 16% uh, of the global burden of disease and injury. Uh, more recently in 2019, at the, the sort of um, uh, just before the pandemic, it was estimated that about one in seven adolescents, for example, experiences a mental disorder every year. And as you see here, depressive and anxiety uh, disorders and self-harm are the leading causes of uh, illness and disability in this age group. Uh, and most recently, again, we heard this earlier, um, in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic context, there's a lot of research that's come out in the last uh, particularly year or so that is showing that uh, adolescents from various uh, different backgrounds have experienced much higher rates of depression, of anxiety, and stress during uh, the pandemic. Uh, prior to the pandemic as well, and, and you heard this from uh, Vikram as well about the crisis, uh, but suicide, for example, is uh, the second leading cause of death uh, for young people globally. But in India, uh, it's the number one cause of death, and it's about 50% higher for girls uh, as compared uh, with boys. And again, in, in LMIC settings like India, in fact, three out of four suicides that globally takes place is happening in an LMIC or a country uh, like India. And the peak age uh, is in late adolescence or early adulthood. Again, making this a very, very important age group to uh, intervene. Uh, most mental health uh, problems also typically have their onset uh, very early in life, so around the age of 14. 
uh, most of these are undetected uh, and untreated. And what I want to highlight here are four uh, sort of key challenges in addressing young people's mental health. Uh, and to explain these a little bit. So the first uh, that you see is, is a very high treatment gap. And the treatment gap is, is the number of individuals who have a mental health problem, but they need treatment, but they're not able to, or they cannot receive it. Uh, and in low and middle income countries, again, like India, for adults, this gap is estimated around 90%, but it's a, maybe close to 99% for young people, which essentially means that most mental health problems remain uh, undiagnosed, uh, unrecognized. Young people do not receive the care uh, that they need or the care that they receive need in time. And third, because these problems go unaddressed, uh, they can result in very uh, long-term chronic um, and disabling illness for young people much uh, later into their adult life. Uh, the second uh, gap and it's a big, big challenge uh, is that most of the research that we do have comes uh, from high income settings. So about 90% of the current evidence about uh, young people and adolescents' mental health actually comes from settings where they do not live uh, and where this life stage of being a young person or being an adolescent is actually quite different uh, than it looks in, in a high income setting. Um, and the last two are kind of related, but uh, the first being that the field of, of young people's mental health has, has been poorly funded for a long time. Uh, and this is in terms of the resources needed to establish uh, or build capacity to deliver mental health care to young people. And finally, going uh, beyond funding alone, um, but, and, and we've heard this, but there is a need for efforts to address uh, cultural as well as professional challenges that contribute to poor mental health amongst young people. So for example, I mean, the premise of, of the commission, so integrating uh, context specific youth friendly mental health services into primary health care, creating awareness uh, and particularly addressing uh, challenges like stigma, uh, which can encourage uh, the uptake of mental health services once these are available. Uh, so you may be wondering uh, why is it so difficult for a young person to access care? And again, you know, the answer may seem quite obvious, uh, but as Raj uh, highlighted, and I will be talking a little bit more about that now, I really want to highlight how many uh, challenges exist along the journey that a young person experiences, as you see in this figure here. So the challenges may exist both on, on the demand side as well as the supply. So understanding when you need help, where you can get the help, uh, you may have a lot of difficulties actually accessing help in the first place. So for example, care is simply out of reach. It's too far away. It's too expensive. It's not tailored to suit a young person's needs. And if you actually do get the care, how do you keep up with it? Uh, and you know, if you've managed to overcome all of these barriers uh, in the first place. So I wanted to bring us to... Um, bring us back to the topic in a sense, and, and I think we've all alluded to this uh, so far, but is when we keep saying all, uh, who do we really mean uh, when we say all? Um, and all is, is a very, uh, it, at least when I read the topic, I felt that this, it, you know, it's extremely aspirational, but I think Vikram, as you said, it's also quite overwhelming when you think of, you know, how will I reach everyone? And to help illustrate this, I wanted to share just four snippets of uh, young people's mental health stories from a recent uh, project that we completed, which was called Man Mela, or sort of Festival of the Mind. And this was a youth-focused storytelling project that shared young people's uh, lived experiences from different parts of India. And in this first story here, uh, and you can sort of click down there on the link if, if you'd like to read the full ones. Um, but this was a story that Monica shared. She talked about the difficulties uh, that she had in the relationship with her parents growing up, uh, particularly around the pressures to perform and the fear that she had of punishment if she didn't excel uh, at school or college. And she describes how this profoundly impacted her uh, mental health, her choices of relationships, um, and how she coped with pressure and difficulties and often in very harmful ways. And she describes what that process of finding help uh, was like. Uh, this is a story from uh, Saddam from Imphal in, in the northeast of India, and he shared his stories about growing up in a conflict zone uh, and also his challenges of accepting his identity uh, and, and gaining acceptance from others about his identity, which almost cost him uh, his life. And he talks about how having the space to express yourself as a young person was so important uh, in, in his life. This third story is uh, from Kehekasha. She was a young 21 year old uh, girl from Delhi. And she talks about what it is like to navigate religion and gender-based discrimination and experiences she had of harassment. 
and feeling very torn uh, at having to choose constantly between her different identities uh, growing up uh, as a young woman uh, in this context. Uh, and finally, this is uh, Namrata's story. And, and growing up, Namrata, Namrata's mother had uh, schizophrenia, a chronic mental health uh, problem. And Namrata had to play multiple roles of being a child and a young person, being a caregiver to her mom uh, and her younger siblings, and also uh, being a student uh, and having to navigate uh, her student and work life. And she talks about how this impacted her mental health uh, and, and things she did to cope, for example, journaling and writing and, and the ways that she found support. So the reason uh, for, for sharing these stories with you, I think it is to go back to, to some of the points Raj mentioned, which is to share that you know, young people are not a single group. They are not a homogenous entity and addressing their needs will not be a one size fits all uh, model. And the second is uh, to highlight that um, while voices are very representative, voices are also not entirely representative. Uh, and these stories highlight mental health problems, you know, as you just heard, these are intrinsically linked with so many other factors in, in a young person's life, whether this is caste, class, gender, sexuality, ability, religion, race, age, and being marginalized on one or more of these can profoundly impact your mental health. So, you know, while this seems uh, overwhelming, um, I think personally, I, I find that, you know, maybe this is also a form of encouragement in that there are multiple points that uh, someone can intervene either as an individual or as an organization, um, or, you know, if you're a larger entity at, at supporting young people's mental health. And I wanted to share a few of our learnings uh, in terms of how this can be uh, actioned. Uh, so a few things that we have learned are uh, the first, and, and we've heard this stigma continues to be a very uh, big barrier. Uh, the second, young people really want to be involved, but they don't necessarily have the resources or training to do this. Uh, context really matters. Uh, again, we've, we've heard this in the last presentation uh, as well, but the, these interactions of social, economic, demographic, cultural, and health-related factors really matter. And being culturally congruent in your approach uh, really matters. Uh, and representation. So as I said, voices shape perception uh, and voices also shape action. So it really matters which voices are being heard and shared. Uh, those do impact policy and they do impact the kinds of larger changes uh, that happen. Uh, and finally, that evidence uh, really matters. And it's important that we prioritize high quality evidence, um, you know, understanding whether something is working and also if something is not working. Uh, and finally, these are just a few recommendations uh, from our work in terms of how we can actually try to reach all. Uh, I'll just briefly touch uh, on these uh, and close. Uh, so the first is involving diverse young people in the start to finish a program. So what this means is young people need to be involved uh, from the very beginning. So whether you, know, you may be conceptualizing a project, you might be writing a grant or thinking of a grant, um, but not just in an advisory role, but there may also be active roles for young people to play. For, so for example, in your team, in your organization, in the actual delivery of, of a program or in evaluating a program. The second is uh, to build spaces for dialogue and discussion and that we really need to continue to share more stories that promote uh, people's lived experience. The third is to ensure that awareness and literacy building is part of programs and um, Without this, it might be hard in some cases also to have uptake to programs, even if you've got a really excellent uh, initiative or an excellent program, you might not have uptake if you are unable to build that engagement around it. Fourth is uh, early intervention, which is now recognized quite widely as a key principle of, of a public mental health approach. So, for example, targeting your interventions or your programs in schools and universities and community settings and you know, to a certain degree online uh, as well. Uh, fifth is to leverage context-specific uh, technologies, and the reason for emphasizing context-specific is, you know, it, it what one technology works in one place, it may not work in another or in, in a different kind of setting. So, being quite uh, specific about that. Uh, so, technology both in terms of training of mental health care workers as well as delivering uh, interventions. And finally, mental health uh, training uh, and leadership building for young people. So I'll close here, and if anyone would like to learn more about any of our programs, I haven't been able to describe these, but you could visit any of the links uh, over there. Well, thank you very much, Patty, for reminding us of, again, another example of how uh, mental health 
uh, uh, problems are not equally distributed in this instance across the age uh, spectrum. And of course, as you rightly pointed out, not only uh, uh, do mental health problems account for a significant amount of the illness-related uh, suffering that happens in this age group, but also most mental health problems begin uh, in this age group. And it's, it, it is an important thing to recognize that this was known well before the pandemic. Uh, and I think there are very important questions that we need to ask ourselves. How and why did societies around the world uh, impose policies that knowingly and intentionally would harm uh, all the necessary social structures that are needed to promote mental health in children and young people, particularly, of course, around the very controversial question about school and educational institution closures around the world. But these are, these are good examples of how actually had we been aware of and sensitive to the mental health needs uh, of specific groups in the population, um, then policies would have been designed in a way to minimize the harms that would result from policies such as, for example, the closure of schools and the stopping of young people from being able to meet one another, which is such a central part uh, of, of, of the developmental needs. Uh, let me turn to the last panelist before we open up to uh, a QA. and a And um, Andrea Bruni uh, is the regional advisor for mental health for the World Health Organization's Southeast Asian region. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vikram. Uh, thank you for this uh, invite. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. And I also want to thank the, the panelists that spoke before me uh, because of their very inspiring presentations. I will make some references um, to their words. Uh, the objective of my presentation today is to share with you a quick snapshot of the situation of mental health in the WHO Southeast Asia region uh, but also to present with you some key messages from the PARO declaration that member states very recently signed in Bhutan. So um, here I'm sharing with you some um, data from our region. So first of all, um, mental conditions are extremely prevalent in our region roughly 260 million people live with a mental disorder, which translates essentially in one person in seven living with a mental disorder in the region. This accounts, mental disorders thus account for a huge uh, morbidity. Um, but unfortunately and dramatically, there are also many suicides in our region. It is estimated that more than 200,000 people die because of suicide every year, and many more attempt suicide. Um, so in this sense, uh, the figures that Patti presented earlier from uh, the global uh, level are aligned with, with uh, the Southeast Asia region, which is no exception in terms of morbidity and mortality. This huge burden uh, of disease, uh, unfortunately, is not uh, tackled enough because the treatment gap is huge for those countries in our region that did this exercise to estimate the treatment gap. Well, um, data show that the treatment gap, meaning the gap existing between the needs of people in terms of mental uh, health and what is offered in terms of services ranges between 75 and 95%. So between 75 and 95% of people that have some needs in mental health is not, are not receiving it. And this is due because of many reasons. Uh, Patti has, has listed some of them during her presentation. One of them is definitely stigma and uh, discrimination. Uh, Shubrata, during her powerful presentation, has uh, hinted to the labeling uh, that is very often associated to, to mental conditions or mental disorders. And this stigma and discrimination is even more pronounced against people with severe mental conditions. We know that people with severe mental disorders die 10 to 20 years earlier than the general population. And this increased mortality is mainly due to non-communicable disease that can be easily uh, treated and also prevented. Um, to add to this um, complicated scenario, climate change and emergencies also impact negatively on mental health and COVID-19 uh, and uh, mental health also have been, uh, it, is, it has been presented by Professor Patel earlier, 
COVID-19 has triggered an increase of 25% in anxiety and depression and is also associated to um, several neurological uh, manifestations. So this is a general overview of the situation in our region. However, a lot of progress uh, has been done uh, at country level. Uh, on many levels, starting from leadership and governance, where many countries have produced mental health policies, legislations, and plans, and you can see the countries listed in this slide. But beyond leadership and governance, also in terms of services, many countries uh, have, have um, achieved good results. For example, Nepal has reduced the treatment gap through the integration of mental health into primary health care through the WHO program known as MHGAP, but also Thailand has strengthened existing community uh, initiatives in health settings, such as primary health care, but also in non-health settings. And in terms of promotion and prevention, a lot has been done. Um, one good example is from Sri Lanka on, in terms of uh, prevention of suicide through banning uh, pesticides, which has resulted in a drop in mortality due to suicide. In the and finally, also in terms of data, because several countries have done mental health surveys to, um, to produce evidence around mental health. If you uh, look at the recently uh, published World Mental Health Report, published by WHO a few months ago, the subtitle of the report is Transforming Mental Health for All. And this transformation implies a number of transitions in our region from underinvestment in mental health towards increased investment and targeted investment. From mental health care delivered mainly by specialists to integration of mental health into primary health care. From centralized mental health services towards community-based mental health services, in com including community centers, mental health units in general hospitals, day centers, and so on and so forth. From lack of priority given to community engagement to strengthening um, uh, community engagement, also through the active and meaningful participation of people with lived experience. We, we heard a, a very powerful testimonial earlier. Uh, and finally, in terms of mental health and psychosocial support to strengthen the mainstream mental health in all policies, to tackle mental health during emergencies and disasters. This is the, um, the PARO declaration that was uh, signed by member states in Bhutan on 6th of September, 2022. This declaration represents a new foundation to reform mental health systems and services in uh, our region. And in this declaration, I will not take you through this articulated a document, but I will just highlight some points of it. Um, this declaration represents a, a very strong commitment in terms of increased investment in mental health and reduction of the treatment gap. Here I'm going to share with you some key messages. Number one is to reorient mental health services by strengthening the capacity of the primary health care system, system and progress towards universal health coverage, which has to do with the mental health for all that was mentioned earlier also by Raj. Commit to ensure an effective and comprehensive response to the mental health needs by establishing community mental health networks and plan for deinstitutionalization. Thirdly, to prioritize adequate investment for mental health services, mainly at primary and secondary level of care, to expand specialized and non-specialized mental health workforce, both are needed. And finally, to combat stigma and discrimination against people with mental disorders, family members, and caregivers. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you to all the panelists for these really complimentary and inspiring presentations. I think we can now uh, move into the question and answer section. And of course, I'll invite all our panelists to also feel free to ask questions to one another. Uh, and I can also see there's a large body of questions uh, that have already uh, been uh, uh, placed by our, our audience. So um, I, but let, let me have the, the, the chance to kick off with a couple of questions that I'd like uh, any of the panelists to respond respond to and please use your hand signal so I can I can see who would like to go first. I keep hearing from some of you this 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 real question about uh, that we don't get diagnosed in time or you know that diagnosis is not possible. And some would argue that maybe diagnosis is the problem. Uh, you know that the act of a diagnosis can label people with things that actually are associated with historical stigma. Getting a diagnosis is a huge bottleneck because the only people who can diagnose are mental health professionals. And then following a diagnosis, you get a kind of cookie cutter approach. You know, you have this diagnosis, you get that treatment. The person seems to disappear behind the diagnosis. And I personally have also often worried that diagnosis as applied in other areas of medicine doesn't really work necessarily as well in the area of mental health. I wondered if any of you had any observations of your own about the utility of diagnosis and does care need to be contingent on a diagnosis? Yes, Shubhrata, please. Uh, Dr. Patel, well, of course, um, on one hand, I do believe that you know labels are for jars and bottles, but at the same time, uh, it is also important to know or at least have a brief idea of what you're dealing with. And that is where I think a diagnosis or um, for a lack of a better word, let's say a label. Okay, maybe let's, let's not say label, just a diagnosis helps. Uh, for example, my own example, I've told you, you know, if uh, I hadn't been told that I have depression, I would never have looked for ways of understanding it and how to uh, and, and helping myself through it and uh, reading our first person accounts of other people who had something similar. So uh, that said, of course, when it comes to mental disorders, probably what we also need to keep in mind is uh, there are no blood tests, there are no reports, there are no x-rays. And uh, basically, you know, my uh, it, it's, it's just our thought and behavior, which is uh, it sometimes gets distorted, which we don't recognize as being us. You know, we become different people. That's what I thought. I had become a different person. And uh, whatever is the diagnosis, probably it's just, um, of course, uh, uh, you know, a collection of uh, symptoms that we're looking for. And uh, when I say that, I say that as a lay person, definitely I'm not a professional, but that's how I see uh, myself. And someone who has a chronic condition, you know, I, I keep getting episode after episode of uh, depressive disorder. So uh, it's also sometimes very difficult to distinguish uh, where anxiety stops, where it's depression, where anxiety stops and where it's ADHD. So those things definitely are there. It's not all that clear, all not black and white, but having some sort of um, name, let's say, to a collection of symptoms or a collection of behaviors or thought patterns uh, to a certain extent definitely is functional. It helps. It helps in uh, the people who have these to look for care options. Andrea. Yes, thank you. Uh, I basically agree with what has been said. Um, there are some, some um, potential negative uh, implications of having a, a diagnosis in mental health. But definitely, at least from a public health perspective, we need to work with diagnosis. We need, we still need these entities. However, it's a very complicated uh, aspect. Uh, for those of you that have looked at the World Mental Health Report, there's a section entirely dedicated to this, to what is mental health, what is a mental health condition, what is a mental disorder, what is a psychosocial disability. So there's quite some complexity uh, about that. And as uh, Shubrata has mentioned, very often diagnoses are just a list of symptoms, right? Or, or dignified syndromes, uh, as someone calls them. So we must um, stay away from uh, 
attaching stigma and discrimination to these um, categories. And we need to think uh, of mental conditions mainly on a continuum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. And you know, I think I think you, you, the word continuum is so very important. That you know, we the the point being, of course, that what I'm hearing all of you say is that care is not contingent on a diagnosis. A diagnosis has a utility, but it cannot be the window through which care is offered. And this is oftentimes the big reason for unmet needs for care, because if care is only triggered by diagnosis and diagnosis so is so difficult and expensive to access, uh, well, it means effectively that care uh, will simply not, not happen as a result. Um, I guess this takes me to, to another um, important question is, uh, and, and you know, Raj, uh, you and others on the panel spoke a lot about, um, you know, the importance of, uh, of social determinants, actually, you know, a variety of social determinants, demographic determinants as well, but social determinants, if we can just spend a moment thinking about this, uh, you know, for many who work uh, in the health space, they feel that the social determinants are beyond the reach of uh, health practitioners, for example, how, how does one deal with these determinants? And so the, 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 the default is that we will focus on the individual um, from a very narrow biomedical perspective. And of course, again, this is valuable, but is it really going to succeed if the, the social determinants that actually have led or contributed immensely to the mental health problem and will remain after you treated the mental health problem, you know, is, is it going to like, is it likely to lead to a long-term uh, outcome that is desirable. I think the general evidence is that actually the long-term outcomes of current treatment paradigms are actually pretty poor compared to many other areas of medicine. And to some extent, that's because we don't deal with social determinants alongside the mental health uh, problem. So again, a question to, to all of you, if we have to make mental health and well-being important for everyone, we're going to have to you know, grapple with this elephant in the room. How do you think practically we could do that? It's a big question. Anyone? Yes, Raj. So, I mean, um, I, I, I get, uh, I think, this a lot that, you know, it, this is not in the purview of mental health. How can mental health take care of all of this? But, um, I mean, at the outset, I have to say that um, it's very important for mental health itself to recognize um, its role um, in these marginalizations and its inequalities, right? At the very least, if we are to start off with something, I'll give you one example. Now, uh, India had the repeal of section 377, uh, I think um, maybe three or four years ago, and it had uh, a judgment in 2012 on trans rights. Now, despite these policy changes, of course, we know what's happening in mental health where LGBTQIA persons are being forced to undergo conversion treatments and more. Um, and you know, like the approach does not then look at this social determinant, right? Um, or for example, um, if even if one is to look at knowledge and what sort of knowledge one learns from um, in the side disciplines, how much truly is mental health curricula um, you know, looking at lived experience, learning from lived experience. And of course, uh, in the end, like I said, I think when I was talking, we have to look at mental, we can't look at mental health as separate from people's contexts. And I, I mean, if we want to address inequality in mental health, we must look at how to address um, social determinants, you know, outside in, in therapy rooms, but also outside therapy rooms, outside randomized uh, controlled trials, in policies, mental health has a role to play in these. In public and private institutions, such as schools, workplaces, and of course, you know, mental health advocacy itself. So yes, um, it's a massive ask, it's huge. Uh, these systems have existed and have been entrenched for so many years. Um, but in mental health, I don't believe that we can shut ourselves off um, to working on these. Absolutely, I completely agree, Raj. Uh, Andrea? Yes, just to echo what uh, Raj said, I mean, it is very clear that mental health and well being even more go well beyond the health sector, not only the mental health domain, but the health sector in general. However, there is space for 
health and mental health to mainstream uh, mental health in other uh, sectors. Uh, Raj was, was hinting to employment, education, protection, housing, and justice, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a role, an active role, that the health sector, and again, the mental health within the health sector can mainstream and coordinate uh, actions and in the integration of, um, of mental health in other domains. There's always space for employment and mental health, education and mental health, housing and mental health, and so on. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Yes, mental health is truly intersectoral. Uh, there can be no sustainable development without mental health, uh, but that also means that mental health is relevant to every sector of sustainable development. Patty. Guys, I just wanted to add, I think, I mean, this might sound like a very basic thing to say, but I think one of the ways is that we really need to talk more about it. Uh, and, and I think to make it visible, because it's very easy sometimes when we say, you know, there are vulnerable groups or vulnerable people, but we don't see people with chronic illnesses. We don't know what a conflict-ridden area looks like. We don't know what it's like uh, to be marginalized or stigmatized on the basis of uh, your gender identity or your ethnicity, unless you are from that experience. Uh, we don't know what it's like to have experienced uh, domestic violence. Um, or to have been exploited or abused, etc. So, and it, it it is important to make it visible because if we don't make that visible, um, you know, those voices shape policy and they shape programs, and programs will not be shaped if those voices aren't there. And I think that the action, though, is you know we have to develop systems where people can share and talk about this openly and safely, uh, and feel safeguarded in doing this. And and for example, in our storytelling work, one of the I think biggest learnings we had is it's actually very difficult. Uh, to tell these stories, it takes many months to tell these stories, uh, develop systems where people, you know, for, for the longer term future are safe, having put all of this information online or in public spaces. But we have to make it visible because it, it quite frankly doesn't exist if it's not visible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me let me, uh, uh, you know, just say a few words about this issue as well from a practical perspective. You know, when we are using non specialist providers and community settings to support uh, the recovery journeys for people with mental health problems, what constitutes a care package doesn't only narrowly focus on their internal worlds, you know, not only on their mood and their anxiety, but also on their social worlds. Um, in fact, the integration, we often talk of the integration of physical health with mental health, but I would argue that even more important is the integration of social care uh, with mental health care, because social problems, I think almost as a rule, coexist with mental health problems. Uh, there are you know, natural bedfellows. And to deal with um, mental health problems without acknowledging and addressing social problems is, 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 is going to be a very poor quality of care. And I think it's important for us to focus on what is actually tractable rather than getting overwhelmed by poverty and gender and these huge words. So for example, what is tractable are issues like interpersonal violence. It's something that you can at least have a practical in strategy for, something that you can try and do something about. Loneliness is another example uh, of a proximal social determinant. So I think there are ways in which if you break down what it is that actually lies on the pathway between poverty or patriarchy and poor mental health and see what are the more individual proximal uh, uh, determinants that there might be things that you can do at the level of frontline care. Let me turn to some questions that are coming in and there are lots and lots of amazing questions and we'll only have time to deal with a few, uh, but I wanted to maybe take this, this question that is, um, that is quite an important one given today's launch of the Lancet uh, commission on Ending Stigma and Discrimination. And the question really is about the fact that individuals uh, with compromised mental health are assumed to have compromised decision-making capacity. Um, and, and I think this is, this is of course, central also to the, uh, the great uh, this ongoing concern about the use of involuntary methods of treatment uh, that people with mental illness often face and people who, who use the term psychosocial disability that Andrea just described are often people with a lived experience of serious mental illness. And they argue that 
it's not the illness that really concerns them, but the way society responds to that illness. And of course, that is why the word disability is, is, is used by, uh, by this community. So I want to pose this question. Um, to what extent are we going to address stigma and discrimination while we also have a, a, a system in which the only situation where a health problem can lead you to be judicially incarcerated uh, for an indefinite period of time is when you have a mental illness. How can we separate stigma and discrimination from the coercion that many people with mental illness experience and most people associate with mental health care uh, uh, historically? How do, we, how do we address that? Yes, Andrea. Yes, Vikram, the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of People with uh, Disability, uh, clearly sets this out that um, a mental health condition, a disability in general, not only mental, but intellectual and so on and so forth, sensorial, uh, never represent grounds for, for discrimination. So uh, this is very uh, clearly stated in, in the convention, which is basically signed and ratified by the majority of countries worldwide. The question is how to translate that into practice, how to make the contents of the CRPD national and sub-national legislation. That is, that is the matter, I think. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that is that is a huge challenge. In India, of course, we have the Mental Health Care Act, which I think is attempting to find that kind of balance between the needs of that the rights of people with mental illness uh, to their own dignity, their freedom of choice, but also recognizing that in certain circumstances, uh, their rights to care might actually precede uh, uh, all other rights. It's a very delicate balancing game. And of course, um, uh, it's not one that, uh, I, I think it has to be dealt with on a case by case basis rather than uh, a one size fits all. Did anyone else have any thoughts on this day when uh, you know this commission is being released on, we've heard the word stigma and discrimination come up repeatedly more generally, uh, you know, what do you think within the South Asian context um, might be the most powerful strategies to address stigma and discrimination. We heard from Patty, for example, disclosure and telling one stories that uh, you know is a very powerful route. I completely second that. Any any other or similar ideas that people might want to suggest regarding addressing stigma and um, and discrimination? What else can we do? Well, perhaps I mean I, you know a, a lot a lot of effort right now is in in mass media campaigns. I don't know whether to what extent people think celebrity campaigns and mass media campaigns have an impact. What might be your views on that, or are there any other perhaps more effective strategies that that might actually address stigma? Shubrata. So. Um... To some extent, I would say that uh, mass media campaigns do help, but they have a flip side also. That, uh, okay, I sorry, sorry, I think my video is off. Sorry about that. So, uh, so yeah, so ADHD, okay, so let's, so uh, yeah, so, but then there's a flip side also that uh, somehow we, uh, I mean, not we, we, when I say we, I mean society, I've often heard this from a lot of people that, um, you know, uh, depression, something like depression is um, a Western uh, phenomenon. It's a first world problem. And uh, it's, you know, celebrities, they have a different lifestyle altogether, not totally moral. So that's why uh, they end up having depression. So there, there's a flip side also, you know, there's, there's always this issue about victim blaming whether it comes to, uh, forget about mental disorders, I've said this, that even for physical disorders, like if someone is thin, people will say that person is too thin, doesn't eat very well. Someone is a little, uh, you know, on the plus side, they will say this person eats so much, look at them. Someone has a heart attack, they say that, okay, look at this person. Uh, you know, if the person is someone who's been seen to be engaged in conspicuous consumption, people would say, look at this person, this person eats so much, drinks so much, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why he or she had a heart attack or they had a heart attack. And uh, uh, you know, if it is someone who's been working out and very fit, people would say, what's the point of working out? You know, Look at this person, they were so fit and still they had a heart attack. So that's the kind of thing that goes, that stigma, 
uh i really don't know how we can overcome this we are trying maybe one of the ways is through uh people like me people who have lived experience just normal everyday people you see that's why i always try to keep normalizing this you know like uh the person sitting next to you could be someone who has depression the person sitting uh, you meet with every day in office might be somebody who has anxiety disorder so this is one of the things that but i don't know how big how impactful but a small drop in the ocean that's something that uh, probably uh if more and more people open up that might that might just help that is um i mean i'll share a few uh strategies that we suggest particularly to young people but i think these apply uh, across the board again simple things that i think anyone can do you do not need to be a professional or a specialist um so the first one is you know learn more about mental health and there's lots of questions in in the comments there i can see about you know where do we get good resources from so i think we have put some links in there so please visit those um but learn about it from trusted sources so you know please avoid whatsapp a uh, kind of information preferably the second uh, is you know learn how to ask uh, if someone's okay and you know it's very simple uh, in terms of checking in on someone's mental health um and related to this i would say be compassionate again it it's not something that it doesn't cost a lot of money to do that you don't need a lot of training to do that but be compassionate in understanding that a lot of people might be struggling and that you may not understand what that uh, difficulty is Uh, if you would like to take it a step ahead there's simple things you can learn uh, on the internet or from organizations where you might be based around sort of what's called first aid training so the way that you would learn uh, first aid for physical health you can learn first aid for mental health in just a few hours and you can do a training and feel much more confident uh in talking about mental health or supporting somebody else um and the last one i think is around knowing your rights and and maybe in part this ties back to your last a uh, question become around you know what do we do to address this sort of larger systemic kind of stigma uh, and it is around you know even professionals do not understand the legislation it's very complicated to know you know even as a mental health researcher or an organization where do we stand in terms of what we can actually do with the mental health legislation in our country or in our um, you know wherever it might be Uh, and you know we've seen such i think a change in in the last couple of decades around how uh, going back to mass media but things like smoking um things like making sexist jokes there has been a huge change in how these have become you know less cool or or uncool for, for lack of a better word and i think that kind of approach we are taking that journey with mental health where you know it's not okay to have or uh, to make stigmatizing comments anymore and i think that's such a great trend uh, to see so it is changing in small ways and i think these are just a few ways that you know people and individuals can um you know it's a few hours or a few minutes out of your day uh, and you will actually very actively contribute uh, to reducing stigma thanks i mean hearing a lot about the importance of the voices of the pe- people with lived experience there's also a lot in the chat about this that there are you know celebrity uh, campaigns are useful but they have their limits uh, shubhata you ri- you really rightly described this i've heard the same thing as well uh, uh but but i think the voice of the lived experience but also there are there are there are you know people in the chat have rightly pointed out those voices can't only come from the middle class you know i think that is a key aspect of of these voices the voices that often you hear do not represent the diversity of india's people including very especially and importantly those who have been oppressed and marginalized those voices don't always get heard the voices of rural and low income communities who live in the slums of big cities in the villages of india actually this is a huge problem uh the the the, the whole the voices question also needs to be representative and a lot of effort needs to be made i believe in the civil society movements to ensure that non english language speaking non middle class people coming from small towns and villages uh, and speaking the many 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 local languages of india are actually the voices that are being also heard because otherwise it perpetuates also the same myth that these are english language middle class wars even if they're not celebrity wars they're not really wars that affect uh, the average uh, indian raj please the floor is yours um so you know i um, it's great to hear all the individual level uh, things that you know we've been talking about in terms of stigma um and these are very important 
but i think there's also a need to challenge the idea of stigma as um, you know an interpersonal or just a social phenomenon and i think the the person who asked the question said something about a lack of decision making uh, being attributed uh, to persons with mental illness and you know we can see that in the indian context in many ways like the right to vote etc but um i think to truly challenge stigma as well uh, we need to look at it as something that resides in multiple contexts because it does re reside in legal frameworks <laughs> it is there in our welfare policies it is there in our economic policies and of course you know as we've discussed it's there in media marketing our social environments um but uh, if we are to challenge it we have to challenge it in everything which will then include um our diagnostic frameworks as well as public health interventions and kind of individually yes but also beyond that yeah thank you so much let me turn to another set of questions i'll i'll kind of combine them and this is really around the role of alternative uh, practitioners faith uh, based practitioners and so on the, the you know the, a few of the questions have really looked at um you know most people in india when they are facing social or spiritual or emotional difficulties and these all completely you know for most people these are not separate things you know we 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 in the professional world try to sort of split these up into spiritual problems and and social problems and mental health problems so actually for most people they actually are indistinguishable and so the question really is in our in our in our aspiration for universal health coverage what is the role that faith based or alternative medical practitioners can play when it comes to realizing mental health and well-being for all so who would like to raj i see your, your, your hand up is that a, a legacy hand or is that a fresh response legacy hand okay patty i mean i'll, I'll take a shot uh, having a very personal identification i think with this question and having grown up uh, in a very religious family um where even i think initially mental health struggles were all i mean the the i would say the the standard response was to pray about it or that it would get better and i think you know we can all agree that you know many of these spiritual practices are extremely important and can be extremely helpful but they might not be our replacements for care and i just answered this question in the chat as well but i think again i religious institutions might be i mean they probably are an excellent point for signposting people for Uh, normalizing the idea of help seeking normalizing um mental health uh, problems mental illness and even faith based leaders uh, can learn more about mental health can be trained in first aid uh, it is essential i think that faith based institutions know where to find those people rather than you know sometimes uh, in engaging in practices that might be more harmful Yeah and there are actually quite a few examples uh, of uh, people working with faith based uh, communities in india for example the dawa or dua sort of initiative in gujarat which is working directly with healing shrines um and i i think we do know particularly in terms of serious mental illness um some of the experiences of people in those healing shrines are far from therapeutic uh and and they're actually very similar to the old style mental asylums where people are chained incarcerated and face some pretty awful physical abuse so i think having a much more balanced perspective about the role of traditional medicine one way it recognizes the important role because people actually access these services far more than the biomedical ones but uh, and therefore they need to be strengthened and incorporated within universal health coverage but also not romanticizing as i think uh, was often the case that somehow traditional and spiritual medicine was so prevalent we didn't need to do anything about mental health care from the biomedical world because you know in india people just simply go to their uh, you know their 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 their, their guru or their priest uh shubhrata and then andrea okay so uh what i would just like to say of course i agree with uh, everything that patty said and of course uh you yourself gave the example of uh, this experiment you know and there's a, a, of the group in the dawa dua group and also um that faith based healers can be leveraged they can uh, that can, they can be trained to provide a bit of um not therapy really but maybe a little bit of hand holding a little bit of counseling the only issue that exists i mean that the two things that i would like to say here first is that uh 
you know, uh, this is my, again, my own experience. I tried everything and my family tried everything and kind of, I don't know what it was, nothing kind of really worked for me. So um, uh, the thing is that a lot of times faith healers get um, obsessed with the idea that their way is the only way. So that is where we need to be a little cautious. And that sometimes ends up uh, trivializing uh, severe mental health issues, serious mental health issues. Because again, as we said, you know, mental health is a spectrum. So someone who's not so sick, someone who may be just having a few bad days would maybe really get better with a little bit of uh, faith and uh, handholding. But someone with severe mental illness may require a lot, lot, lot more. So that's one place where we need to be careful that uh, they, sometimes faith healers end up trivializing as well as stigmatizing. So there's just this thing that it can prove to be counterproductive, number one. And number two, again, because we really don't know, I mean, it's biopsychosocial, so it's, it's every person is different. What will work for them? What is, what is uh, uh, you know, if resulted in the, the mental disorder in the first place? We, we cannot say for certainty what is happening there. So that's why uh, it's okay to try everything, have an open mind. But uh, certain practices are harmful. Let's stay away from them. And uh, let's take faith, healing, and everything else and new age especially because it's uh, it's 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 very nice you know when you're told that you think you'll be all right and the universe will grant it to you i mean does it really happen that way <laughs> i wish it did because i wanted to get well so desperately and it took me such a long time to get better so a little bit of caution is all i wanted to say yeah thank you that's very well put shubrata and andrea and then we're going to round up with one last question to each of you andrea Yes, thank you. No, I agree with what has been said, just to reiterate that uh, faith-based approach, traditional medicine, cultural approaches, they are not one single entity. So we have a lot of things in there. So I don't think there is one single answer to, to address this question. However, it's important to explore potential synergies and uh, traditional and cultural approaches may play uh, a role, um, not only in India, but also in other countries and in other regions uh, around the world. Um, I also think that the health sector very often does not have the capacity uh, to uh, investigate and follow up on the abuses, Vikram, that you were mentioning that sometimes happen in, in this sort of, of settings. However, it's, it's important to think critically about it, especially to the flip side of it. The flip side of it is what is the, um, um, what is mental health doing to integrate traditional cultural uh, perspectives into the mental health practices? starting, for example, from interviewing skills and um, idioms of distress and so on and so forth. So what kind of uh, knowledge and skills are given to health professionals and mental health professionals to, to deal uh, with, uh, with cultures? And that is very important. And I agree with what Shubharta said, that there is not only one way. Uh, the reality is that very often people try uh, many different things. And uh, it's important for the clinician, however, to be aware of it. And sometimes um, traditional medicines and cultural interventions also uh, rely on pharmacological approaches. And that is very important for the clinician to be aware of what other um, uh, substances are being taken by, by the person. Thanks. Andrea, thank you. So in rounding up and closing, uh, closing this uh, wonderful, uh, invigorating discussion, 10 seconds to each of you uh, to answer, uh, respond to the fact that, you know, Andrea reminded us that all the countries in the region have signed the PARO declaration and encourage everybody uh, connected to actually have a look at the declaration. And one of the key points was made uh, was that all countries have committed to increasing the investment in mental health. If you were in charge of what the investment should be used for, what would be the single most important thing you would back uh, in, 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 in making mental health and well-being uh, a priority for all? Raj? Um, I think in terms of policies, um, connecting linkages for uh, persons with mental illness and um, you know, social support networks. Thank you. Patty? I think preventive and promotive services at uh, the school level and primary care level. Great. Andrea? 
to establish community uh, community based mental health networks which include strengthening uh, centers in the communities uh, psychiatric units in general hospitals but also uh, primary health care so using this additional um, uh, resources in a rational way on the one hand but on the other hand also um, downsizing psychiatric hospitals and asylums through the process of the institutionalization, which makes sense from a public health perspective to reduce the treatment gap, but also in terms of human rights and also of tackling stigma this time from, from the health sector. Thank you. And Shubrata, you get the last word. Oh, Andrea has already said what I wanted to say, but that's, that's the way, you know, mobilizing the community. This is the best way to uh, spread awareness fight the stigma as well as discrimination. The community has to be the very, very base of all mental health care services. Thank you, Shubhrata. Thanks to all the audience. We had more than 150 people who signed in on the Zoom, and I know uh, several hundred more on the live stream. It's been terrific to have such a great engagement on this topic. I invite you all to complete the review form. Please do that. It's very helpful to us. Get involved with the Lancet Citizens Commission. This is intended to be a big tent. Everyone's invited. If you're passionate about universal health coverage in India, then the Lancet Citizen Commission offers you a place where you can exchange ideas, learn more, share resources, and be part of a movement. Thank you all for joining us today. Until the next webinar, bye-bye now.